Hello everyone, this is a presentation by Ahmed, Andrew, and Sam, and we are doing this on the paper titled The Lichen Symbiosis Review Through the Genomes of Cladonia Grayi and its Algal Partner, Astriochlorosis Gleromata, by Daniel Armalo, Olaf Muller, and like 40 other people. Basically, this paper is about the first parallel genomic analysis of the microbiome Cladonia Grayi and the green algal photobiont Astriochlorosis gloromata, and plans to take a look at the molecular biology and perhaps even the evolutionary relationship associated with the symbiosis in early developmental cultures. Since this is a pre-recorded video and not a live presentation, you won't have the chance to ask us questions as you watch this. So, I recommend that as you do watch this, open up a Word doc or something, Note the slide number and question you have about this. Without further ado, let's begin. Here is some background info on lichens for anyone who might not know exactly what a lichen is, and that includes myself. So a lichen is a composite organism made up of a symbiosis between a mycobiont, which is a specialized fungi, and a photobiont which is a unicellular phototrophic algae or cyanobacteria. Even the word symbiosis was first coined to describe the mutualistic relationship that exists in lichens. Globally, there are between 18 to 20,000 lichen species, which are composed of 80 to 20,000 mycobionts, while only 120 different photobionts exist. The fossil record shows that lichens have existed for around 400 million years. But in this long-term relationship, both symbiotes have maintained cellular and genetic independence from each other. Alright, now it's time for a video that Sam forced me to put in this video. So sometimes it's good to get down on the ground in amongst the moss and leaves and see what's down here. And uh, quite often you'll find old logs and um, fallen branches and things. Um, and when you find habitats like that, quite often you find lichens like this. This is a cladonia. And as you can see, it forms these amazingly wonderful sort of gothic structures. These are called padisha, these bits that, that grow upwards from the substrate. And on the on the tops of the padisha, there are these little brown blobs. These are called the apothecia, and these are the fruiting bodies which produce the spores from which the, the lichen fungus reproduces. Incredibly beautiful. Sometimes people ask me, what's the point of lichens, or what do they do? And I usually answer by saying something like, what's the point of anything? What do we do? But they do have, they do have a, a sort of a place in the ecosystem. Sometimes, sometimes they, they will, of course, by fix, be fixing carbon and nitrogen. And they're a home for lots of little creatures. Um, and there's even a small food chain which is completely reliant on lichens. Bark flies which eat lichens and then wasps that entirely predate on the, on the bark flies. But mostly they're just a source of really glorious biodiversity right here in our woodlands. So yeah, lichens are quite cool. Anyway, as you can see in this figure, this is a Clodonia grayi lichen. By the way, don't worry too much about the text, that's just there for show. So as you can see, this is the podelia, which are the goblet-shaped guys there. They are covered in what are called soredia, which are structures containing both the myco and photobion that detach in wind and rain for propagation. It was from said Soridia that researchers isolated single spores of both symbiotes for analysis. All right, Sam, take over for me now. P please, my voice hurts. First, what the researchers did was they performed a whole genome analysis with annotations via alumina single end reads and various gene model pipelines. The researchers analyzed the nuclear genome of Cladonia gray and Osterochloris along with three organelle genomes, fungal mitochondria, algal mitochondria, and chloroplast. Here's information about the genome size, number of predicted genes, proteins, etc. 
In figure two, they compared their whole genome assemblies of fungi cladonia microbiont and the algae osteochlorus the photobiont to databases and created a phylogenetic tree. They compared their whole genome assemblies to different phylogenetic groups, as you can see on the left for the algae chlorophytes a phylum. You can see recent and older replicas of their DNA sequences to each other along with their own unique sequences in their own genome. The unique sequences make them their own species, different from each other on the tree. The researchers, the researchers said that the genome size was average for a lichen, so it was not affected by transposable elements that increases the size of the genome, except for this transposable element that they found. In figure three, from their whole genome analysis, the researchers discovered a low GC content region that matches a viral genome. The repeated region of the low GC content are found nowhere else in the genome, the photobiome. Looking at A in figure three, you can see the scaffolding at 120 and 80 with the inverted repeats. The region contains 462 proteins with 236 of them having a match to a double-stranded DNA virus. The region also has much less introns than compared to other genes in Osteochlorus. The pie chart shows the percentage of genes found in which types of organisms, eukaryotic or viral, of the low GC content region in the whole genome. This is evidence of horizontal gene transfer. Genes in this region that relate to the viral protein that are, are also actively expressed um, on some of the genes. The relationship between these genes and the symbiotic nature of the algae with its fungi is unclear. I thought this was interesting and one of the most easily understandable parts of this whole entire paper. The researchers then look at heterothalism and homothalism. These concepts have to deal with reproduction. There are two mating genes in Australochlorus, um, Asteomites, MAT11 and MAT12. These proteins share the same locus. If an organism has both genes, it is considered self-fertile, homothalism. And if it only has one gene, it is considered self-sterile, heterothalism. This is also found in lichen fungi like Cladonia. You can see in figure 4a the locus with MAT genes with Cladonia. You can see that the MAT11 gene and the ortholog MAT117 gene, but there's no MAT12. Then on the bottom, you see MAT12, but no MAT11. There are vestigial sequences of these genes present. They also provide other Cladonia species with gene orthologs. The researchers, the researchers provide a scheme in B for how maybe over time the homothallic ancestors evolved to lose either the MAT1 gene or the MAT12 gene to become heterothallic and leave these vestigial sequences of MAT12 or MAT11 in whichever one they're lacking. Heterothalism probably evolved from homothalism and cladonia in the genetic evidence for selection of partner switching to benefit in genome diversity to adapt to environments is what the research has concluded. It's good to not be self-fertile so they can find new mates to increase their genetic diversity, good for their environment. Next, the researchers wanted to identify genes and gene products that were of potential symbiotic importance. So what they did was isolate samples of the algae and fungus, as well as a sample of the algae and fungus together, and grew up three independent cultures. The first was a monoculture of the algae. The second was a monoculture of the fungus. The third, a co-culture of the algae and fungus together. Researchers grew these cultures for 21 days, and then extracted and purified the RNA from the individual cultures and use this RNA to produce cDNA libraries, which they used to quantify gene expression, and compared them across the three cultures. Researchers chose an arbitrary way of designating whether the genes were induced or repressed in co-culture relative to the monoculture, where induced or repressed meant a change of at least 1.5 times more or less in co-culture than when compared to the monoculture. They did this using RPKM, which is reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads, and expressed them as a co-mo ratio, a ratio of the expression shown in the co-culture divided by the expression shown in the monoculture. Due to differing ranges in the co-mo ratio, a secondary induction threshold was introduced with a COMO ratio greater than 2 for the fungus and a COMO ratio greater than 1.3 for the algae, signifying an increase in gene expression. This gave 795 upregulated genes in the fungus and 471 upregulated genes in the algae. This information is also described in Figure 7. 
just giving a picture of what the induction and repression of genes looks like against the entirety of each symbiont's genome. Here, the graph is composed of a point for each gene in each symbiont's genome plotted against its COMO ratio, where all the genes that by the researcher's standards were considered to be induced are highlighted in red, while all those considered to be repressed are highlighted in blue. As you can see, 795 fungal genes and 471 algal genes were induced in co-culture of the fungus and algae. The induced genes for each symbiont were identified using BLAST, GO annotations, and PFAM. GO annotations is gene ontology, basically a database of genetic sequences matched with attributes of the gene product. PFAM is a protein family database. The genes were put into three categories, as can be seen in figure eight, of unknowns, insufficiently defined, and better defined. With the better defined category then being further broken down into these different categories. The size of the boxes is the relative proportion of the genes compared to the rest of the better defined genes, and the numbers refer to how much these gene groupings increased in expression relative to the rest of the better defined genes. Through this analysis, it was shown that the induced better defined algal genes showed an increase in the expression of flagellar genes. This is interesting because during lichenization, Asterochlorus is likely in a non-motile state, and as such, we would expect uh, to not find any flagellar genes being expressed at all. The researchers explored this in what Dr. Lynn Cornby called a very poorly explained figure. What we were able to glean from this was basically that we would expect that over the many years of symbiosis that Asterochlorus might have lost its motility genes, but in fact, Asterochlorus has retained a great number of their flagellar genes, which are highlighted in green. Um, and this is despite being more closely related to the non-motile C. subellipsoidea and C. variabilis, which is highlighted in red, uh, when compared to the more distantly related and known mobile C. reinharti and V. carteri, which are highlighted in purple. This has implications for the autonomy of the symbionts, that despite their long-term relationship, the algae has maintained the ability to detach from the lichen for sexual reproduction, which leads to the overall increased adaptability of the lichen. Slide 14. Researchers then looked more specifically at frequency of secreted proteins as they found that relative to their overall genomic frequency, secreted proteins make up a larger portion of the total transcriptome. This is interesting to notice, however, the figure is not overly clear. In figure 10, polyols are the molecules of carbons transferred from algae to fungi and lichens. Ribitol is a polyol that has been recently identified to have a transporter and lichen fungus. Five ribotol transporters were identified in the genome analysis, but only one was overexpressed in co-culture, as you can see in figure 10a. One means no difference in expression. Over one means expressed more in co-culture, and less than one is underexpressed in co-culture. Uh, transmembrane domains are purple in figure B, and the consensus sequences to sugar transporters and yeast are in cyan. Created, uh, they also created a phylogenetic tree of these transporters to other fungi sugar transporters, and you can see that in figure C. So there's also transport, there's also transfer of nitrogen from microbionts to eukaryotic algal photobionts. Uh, the microbiont has a 5.6 culture to monoculture ratio, co-culture to monoculture ratio of overexpression for ammonia transporters, pointing at um, ammonia and H4 plus as a major nitrogen source provided by the microbiont to the photobiont. Reliance of each partner on the other as a restricted nutrient source is also reflected by the contraction of the sugar transportome in C gray and by the reduced nitrate assimilation potential in A, in A glomerata. So we just uh, started talking about contraction and expansion in gene families. If a gene family is expanding, this means evolution is acting on these genes to be selected for and change over time to suit an organism's environment. If a gene family is contracting, evolution is not acting on this gene and is staying conserved, probably because it's serving a vital purpose. 
or maybe because it's not serving anything at all, it's not being selected for, and the organism will eventually lose it. If a Ribitol transporter is being conserved, gene families were looked at to be expanding or contracting in both organisms. Um, the most notable expansion involved 204 HET incompatibil incompatibility proteins, 13 of which are also induced in co-culture. There's 156 ancrin domain proteins, an 80-member family of multi-transmembrane proteins um, of unknown function with 10 co-culture-induced members, FAM668, a fructose amine kinase family with 7 members of which 3 are co-culture-induced, the family of polyketide synth synthases, PKSs, which deal with metabolism, um, have expanded, and non-ribosomal peptide synthases with at least 29 members. They are all expanding. Um, most importantly, the carbohydrate transporter FAM1, MFS, major facilitator superfamily, FAM2 and FAM7, and amino acid permease FAM22 are dramatically reduced. And some members of these families are also induced in co-culture or are slow evolvers. This is information that helps back up the conclusion that the Ribitol transporter is being conserved to be reliant on a symbiotic partner for carbon, along with um, maybe ammonia too, because we saw expanding um, amine, uh, fructose amine kinase family. Cut that last part out. Cut that last part about fructose amine kinase family. Uh, looking at figure 11, I believe the researchers decided to include this because it might be a jumping point for someone who wants to delve into the function of all these unknown, now more defined, PKSs. Uh, it serves for a further point of research for metabolic potential of the lichen cladonia. At this point of the paper, it is a huge information grab and trying to find loose conclusions between the data. It's almost like you can't just present a paper with data. They have to find some kind of conclusions to entice the reader. In figure 12... They um, create a phylogenetic tree by extracting information from the many gene expanding families of Ostelochloris. Um, so they made a phylogenetic uh, tree of the protein ATPase. And the phylogeny suggests that there has been much horizontal gene transfer because of the many different archaea, eukaryotic, and prokaryotic lineages present throughout this whole tree. Looking at figure 13, the protein phylogeny of the 8 C gray G alpha subunits are clustered into three major Mag A, Mag B, and Mag C clades. At the bottom are unique Mag C paralogs that the researchers believe to be specialized for cladonia. Also expanded are families of well known components of MAP K pathways, G protein alpha subunits, RGS proteins, and dual specificity phosphatases, which we'll look at next when we look at expanding transcriptional factor proteins. But for right now, in figure 13, we are looking at a phylogenetic analysis of the 8G alpha subunits in C. gray, and they show that three correspond to the standard G alpha subunits present in all fungi, Mag A, Mag B, and Mag C, while the, uh, the other five appear to be divergent paralogs of Mag C, which you can see at the tree at the bottom. And these paralogs are possibly adapted to specific symbiotic functions. Um, proteins corresponding to the standard and the five new G-alpha subunits are also in the genome of the lichen fungus, endocarpon pisillum, which belongs to a whole different class of lichenized fungi. So G-alpha protein family expansion might be widespread among lichens, another loose conclusion that encourages other researchers to delve into. Looking at expanding and contracting transcriptional factors in cladonia and non-lichenized fungi, the researchers noticed cladonia has undergone expansion more than non-lichenized fungi, hinting this is due to symbiotic relationship of cladonia. If you look at figure 14, the green triangles are expanding families, red triangles are contracting families, the fungi are on the left, the algae are on the right, green circle are families gained, red circles are families lost, And the researchers try to conclude the plasticity of the transcriptional families may be due to the ability of both symbionts to live on their own. Stresses placed on lichens by repeated, rapid, and large oscillations in their exposure to light, temperature, or hydration might have led to the expansion of stress-related transcriptional factors in both symbionts. Looking at figure 15, it shows nitrate assimilation clusters of chlorophytes, also known as green algae. The bottom of the rows is R-algae of interest, Ostelochloris. 
As you can see, the cluster has been greatly reduced. This is most likely to the fact that photobionts cannot capture nitrogen themselves when they're encapsulated by their fungi partner. The algae receives its nitrogen from the fungus, while the fungus receives carbon. So the nitrogen assimilation gene was slowly selected out evolutionarily in reliance on the fungi. Looking at the bottom of the figure, researchers found these genes are also modulated. Um, it's turned down by 50% in co-culture rather than in monoculture. They hypothesize this is because algae can assimilate nitrogen on its own without its fungi when it's not with its fungi partner using these genes whenever it's free living. So when it's free living, it will overexpress these genes, and then when it's in uh, co-culture, it will lower the expression of the genes to get a good um, homeostasis with its symbiote. Criticisms. I had a few criticisms of this paper besides that some of the figures were confusing. Uh, namely, and I guess this isn't actually a criticism as the authors do mention it, but it's in regards to their co-culture monoculture system that they use to explore the symbiosis between these two organisms, uh, which they describe saying uh, it needs underlining that this co-culture system and similar ones do not proceed beyond formation of poorly differentiated lichenoids and do not capture the complete interaction network extended in space and time needed for proper lichenization in nature. Uh, so in other words, their findings come from a crude model that doesn't accurately describe what occurs in nature. My second criticism is illustrated in figure eight, where they discuss upregulated genes occurring in the co-culture. I know that the researchers were limited uh, by what has already been defined in other literature and databases to determine the genes that were upregulated. But as you can see here, there's a huge proportion of genes that are either designated unknowns or insufficiently defined. This leads me to wonder how you could confidently present that the numbers and gene categories uh, from the better defined section are accurate uh, at depicting the transcriptome of each symbiont. The researchers have provided their own conclusions to all the research they have done. However, this is our personal summary of everything we have talked about this, thus far. A lichen is a composite organism made up of a symbiosis between a microbiont and a photobiont. The researchers performed whole genome analysis through Illumina single end reads. There is evidence of horizontal gene transfer happening between the algae and the fungi. How, however, more research is needed. Homothalism means having more MAT genes, which means being more self-fertile. Heterothalism just means having one gene and therefore self-sterile. Heterothalism likely evolved from homothalism to help the organism in being more flexible and adapting to its environment. Mycobionts can give nitrogen to photobionts. Expanding gene families means more evolution is acting on said genes, which means said genes are in flux. Contracting gene families lack evolution, and therefore said genes are conserved. It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! What are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!